you can't just be a single issue voter. The world is more complex. There's, there's more at stake than that. Have you heard this one? It usually comes from people who want you to vote for Kamala or against Trump more accurately, but I imagine there are issues that exist for people who want you to do the reverse as well. Uh, either way, yes, I've heard it too. And I just need to say that I hate it when people hit me with this single issue voter thing. Like somehow caring about one issue, whether it's genocide or anything else, makes you naive or, or myopic. As if focusing on something so massive and so urgent is a flaw. It's condescending and it's insulting. But let me suppress this anger that I have as, as best as I can to take it as seriously as I can in this essay. Because I think there's, there's two ways to respond to being kind of chastised or, or lectured to as a single issue voter. One way to respond, which is important, is to push back and say, genocide is not just another issue. It's the issue. It's the line that once crossed should override everything else. When genocide is on the ballot, there is no balancing act with tax policy or climate change or any other concern. You know, you can't both sides mass extermination. Uh, and yes, uh, trigger warning here, because I'm going to be looking at and putting on the screen some of the images and videos that have come out of Gaza. And I know there are some who can't look, perhaps, for fear of being too devastated or crossing some internal threshold where you're filled with an unbearable amount of hatred or rage or fury that you're scared of what you might do um, by filling these images in your head. And I get that. Um, so look away from the screen uh, if you need to. I'm going to be putting up images from, of course, the fires and the tents with people hooked up to IVs. Uh, I'm also going to put up an image from a short documentary called Starving Gaza. Um, okay. They're on the screen now, so I'll let you know when you can look again and they're off. A friend of me texted me after the tent fires that Israel had just had its gas chamber moment. And I think that might be true, but also kind of brace yourself because in World War II, there were published reports trickling out primarily from the Polish underground sources about max mass executions and potential gas chamber usage in as early as July of 1942. And by the end of 1942, news about gas chambers and extermination camps uh, was being reported in some British and American papers. And of course, that genocide continued for another three years. So, okay, I've taken down the images now, so you can look again if you don't want to, if you didn't want to digest them. Um, by, by the way, I think that debate about whether we should look or not look at certain images like this is pretty interesting. And... I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it. Uh, it. It could be a good subject for a future conversation, uh, but I do feel this sense, um, perhaps for someone like me who grew up with a degree of complicity around me on this issue, uh, a profound lesson to understand how genocides, and in particular the Holocaust, actually happened in order to never allow anything like it to surface again. I feel like I don't have a right to look away uh, and in some ways, I want to keep reminding myself to bear witness to where we are. Um, it's difficult, I know, but I think I can bear it only by reminding myself that it's never normal. Perhaps people worry about that, about becoming numb to these kinds of images and horror. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, to be honest, but I'll set that wonder aside for the rest of this essay. And the images I use from here on out will be more philosophical and abstract, including also some pop culture references and science fiction references. Okay, so when I look at either candidate or certain candidates, I can't pull the lever for them because I see that lever as a vote for genocide, whether it's through complicity, direct action, selfishness, utilitarian, neoliberal or neoconservative neo calculations, or simply turning a blind eye, it's still a vote for people who allow, encourage, fund, and otherwise enable genocide. And that alone should be enough to make people take their hand off the voting lever. But here's what I really want to dig into, because this is where the conversation, I think, needs to go. And frankly, the better response to the charge of single-issue voting 
Because everything I just laid out would very likely be heard and interpreted as me suggesting that these people who are voting just really don't care enough about genocide or, or brown people on the other side of a planet or something like that. It would likely be heard as an affront to their immorality or lack of compassion or something. And that likely wouldn't be a very productive conversation with someone like Mehdi Hassan. Because, of course, they'd remind you that they are choosing between the lesser of two evils. They agree that genocide is evil, and how dare you suggest that they don't care enough. They just think that part of the evil cancels itself out because it appears on both sides of the math equation. They're just trying to navigate the difficult situation. Okay, that probably sounds pretty familiar to you here. Uh, and so what I think is the better response, and frankly the much more true one is, is what I'm going to get into. Because I resent the idea of being labeled a single issue voter. Not just because it's dismissive, but because it's the exact opposite of the reality. The truth is, I'm not refusing to vote for certain people because of one narrow isolated issue, no matter how huge. I'm not focusing on genocide because it's just a single issue. I'm not voting for these people because what's happening isn't a single issue. Focusing on this genocide reveals an entire system, a sprawling, interconnected web of issues that this vote is about. Neocolonialism, military occupations, imperialism, the war machine that profits from endless conflict. These aren't abstract concerns. They're embedded in the very structure of this vote. These are the kinds of things I've been talking about more and more on my channel here and why I'm so focused on expanding the conversation beyond the single issue. When you start talking about Gaza and wanting to understand how we got here, you're talking about all of that. Caring about genocide isn't myopic. It's expansive. It forces you to look at the whole damn picture, at how militaries, governments, corporations, and the media all have worked together to keep these atrocities going. It forces you to reckon with the reality that this isn't just one isolated conflict. It's part of a much larger system that thrives on violence, that, sus that sustains itself through exploitation and destruction. And I know, some of that stuff can start to sound conspiratorial, if we don't keep our philosophy and skepticism sound and intact. And I hear you. I think that's a tremendous challenge and a concern. I, I have an audio episode in my archive uh, that I'll, I'll link to in the description about conspiracy theories and a very personal connection to them, uh, including a, a, a really sad story about a very close friend of mine who got lost in them. Uh, this is something that is insanely important to me, and I can only promise to be as diligent as possible with those lines. But, man, it's difficult not to think just how conspiratorial you would sound talking about any of the coups in Africa and Guatemala and beyond that Vijay and I talked about in the previous conversation on, on the Global South. And generally, the mantra to remind yourself, to try to keep your footing with conspiracies is this one. Uh, once you've located who benefits from a world event, you have not necessarily also located who orchestrated that event. So yes, there are ugly incentives and structures that promote and encourage and welcome all kinds of awful things. And that, frankly, is enough of a massive problem. And really, it's a much bigger problem than the instances where an actual conspiracy to engineer or produce an event in a kind of false flag type of operation and cover it up actually does happen, which of course does happen. But sometimes we can go sniffing for evidence of that kind of, you know, juicy, sinister cover up and miss the much more awful problem on the surface of a mere perverse, inhumane incentive and catastrophe profiteering. You know, the fact that Zero reserve banking and currency manipulations lays the groundwork for mundane, selfish, self-deceiving incentives to encourage or promote wars and play both sides of them is bad enough, isn't it? You don't even have to take the next step to try to prove that those kinds of things actually happen at the conspiratorial level, right? The incentives built into the system are enough. And I realize now that 
the breakdown I gave of cognitive dissonance in my previous conversation with uh, Stav Sinai is really relevant here. So I'll link to that time stamped in the description as well, uh, because there's probably a small set of people who are willing to really engage in the kind of full on conspiracies that we can conjure up. But the mechanisms of justificationism and internal mental revisionism in order to quell the anxiety of cognitive dissonance are universal and as common as, as breathing. So take a look at that, uh, the Leon Festinger theory of cognitive dissonance that I walked through when you get a moment. I think it's really relevant here. Uh, but just for an example, and this is on topic, I'm going to quickly show a tiny bit of research here live. Uh, just a simple question that I'm going to plug into to good old chat GPT. Uh, and it's this. So I'll just read along as it appears on the screen. This is what I'm typing into it here. Tell me the top 25 United States politicians or politically influential people who are currently in or out of office who also hold personal, personal or familial investments in some of the military contractors and the major arms industry companies which deal weapons uh, in the weapons systems. Uh, also tell me which political party the person belongs to and what position that they held or currently hold in the government uh, and also show the sources you are using for this information. So it's thinking now because of course I know ChatGPT is not perfect. Uh, I have the paid version though, and it's nice that it can show you its work and find the original source. But yes, do further research. That's the, the caveat. Okay, and within a matter of seconds, here we have this list, which could of course go on and on and on. I asked for just 25 uh, and I could share this information with you. It looks like much of it, it's coming from uh, this site that I'm clicking on, as well as Wikipedia, which you can always click through the footnotes and find the sources as well. Uh, it looks like Truthout is one of the sources as well. Okay, it, so there you go, <laughs> there's a lot. And let's just ask another question to follow up. Okay, now take those 25 names you've given me and tell me their stated stance on military aid to the state of Israel and perhaps their voting record on military budgets while they were in office. And so, you know, there you go, right? And listen, that research took about 30 seconds. And does it prove anything about, you know, a, a conspiracy on the ground or people being told what to say or that something like October 7th was, was a false flag operation or, or was allowed to happen? No. Of course not. Like I said, discovering who benefits does not necessarily mean you've, you've discovered who engineered it. It's possible that those are engineered. But again, it's, it's like below the thing that actually matters. Those incentives I just showed you are the problem. So just keep your skepticism and reason intact here. It's possible, of course, that all of these people really do just happen to have an ideological committed stance to something like... Israel, and also happen to just have investments that benefit because of that stance. Sure, chicken and egg question. And again, I would encourage you to see my cognitive dissonance explanation in that essay to see how that works psychologically. Uh, but obviously the incentives are a problem, right? I mean, it's almost just so in your face as to be a bit daunting, so you almost want to look for something more. Uh, so I'll put that aside, but I think that all serves the point that I'm trying to make here that no, I'm not a single issue voter. I'm refusing to vote for any of these people precisely because this is not a single issue. For so many, this genocide has been the key that's unlocked everything else, or maybe the trigger which has sparked such massive cognitive dissidence that fewer of us are able to simply quiet the voice in our conscious that tells us that something is very wrong. And on the other side of that confrontation is something much more entrenched and pervasive than one particularly extreme concentration of violence and injustice in the Middle East, which of course was perhaps knowingly or subconsciously a huge aspect of the methodology sparked by the deeply disturbing and shocking day of October 7th, 2023. 
And for those who just recently have discovered me, you know, there's a lurking dangerous question around what I just said. And it's a question that the, the writer and academic Richard English and I discuss in what is one of the, the, the lesser viewed conversations I've had on this channel since October 7th, but it may actually be the most important one. Uh, Richard English dares ask and write about the question, does terrorism work? Uh, so also give that one a click and a listen when you have the brain space for it. And I want to stay here on this point for a second as well, because in my previous conversation with Stavit Sinai, I brought up the Nat Turner slave revolt analogy again, which I know many people have become aware of in the last few months. ta Coates and Norman Finkelstein, and of course people like me have been using it to reference a kind of terrible violence, which is in service of what we contend is an ultimately just or moral cause. Uh, resisting and ending the institution of slavery in Nat Turner's case, and resisting and ending the Zionist form of apartheid and domination in this case. Uh, but I just want to really stress the point here that this, of course, does not condone the violence of Hamas. I have a video all about that as well. But I also want to just read from a few newspapers that covered the events of Nat Turner in 1831. And remember, Turner and his group, which was preaching their own religious motivations and mythology, he was seeing spirits in the sky and maybe thought he was the Messiah, they had just gone on a rampage uh, in Virginia and killed children and men and women, slave owners and non-slave owners alike. Uh, and so the obvious parallel to the news coverage on that day would be something like the aftermath of a day like October 7th. So this one here, I'm just going to read a, a few of them that I collected or, or reference them. This one's the Petersburg Intelligentsia on August 26, 1831. They wrote, this revolt demonstrates the inherent savagery of the African race and their incapacity for civilization. The Richmond Inquirer on August 30th, 1831, described the rebels as fanatical desperados, a fiend-like band of misled bloodhounds who sought the total extermination of the whites. Those were, desperados, interestingly, was a, was a popular word in that day, which obviously would maybe subs be substituted with terrorists these days. Um, Samuel Warner, in his pamphlet, The Authentic and Imperial Narrative, wrote that Turner and his followers, sub subjects, uh, subjected their victims to wanton barbary, barbarity, sorry, wanton barbarity, calling them bloodthirsty monsters, and warning that their aim was the total extermination of the whites. The Lynchburg Virginian, on September 8, 1831, uh, described Turner's group as fiend-like band of de desperados and framed their actions as, uh, as the worst atrocities ever witnessed in our state, warning that they should be seen as a faithful warning against any similar act of violence. So there's, there's many of these, and the word desperados, and uh, fiends and, and barbarians were, were used at the time. But there was one newspaper that, prior to this event, had always had a different stance. It was called The Liberator. I think it was out of Boston. And it had been writing for years in hopes of what they called global emancipation. They were obviously in favor of, of ending the institution of slavery and maybe taking it even larger. Um, they often had advertisements in it for free goods stores, which uh, are really interesting. There were stores that carried goods which did not purchase products or include products that were produced uh, by slaves, like maybe certain cotton goods and whatnot, apparently often at lesser quality at the time. Uh, sounds quite familiar to something like the BDS movement. Uh, these stores were often run by the Quakers and the Quaker Society. Um, so anyway, so the Liberator was this kind of philosophical and political stance. And so how did they cover the news of the violence of Nat Turner's group? And it was this quote, what we have so long predicted at the peril of being stigmatized as an alarmist and de declaimer has commenced its fulfillment. And then it continued, we are compelled to regret the lamentable events that have transpired, but let not our sympathy for the slain blind us to the true cause of these dreadful occurrences the hellish system of oppression, which has so long been, been practiced with impunity. So regret the lamentable events and admit and offer sympathy for the slain, but then turn the focus to the context which they contend birthed this violence. And so does that all sound 
disturbingly familiar to you? Because it really should. And then you could say that looking back on that now, the Liberator newspaper was somehow vindicated morally because the institution of slavery was just such an obvious injustice. And if the Israel defender agrees with that, but claims the analogy falls apart there because Zionism has done no such injustice to the Palestinian, well then we are at quite an impasse with being confronted with a denier of history. Which actually brings me back to the election discussion, because of course I saw those recent quotes from Donald Trump about defunding schools who suggest that America was founded on stolen land or was built on the backs of slavery. Just an obvious denier of history, if there ever was one, right? And remember that I, nor Stavit Sinai, nor Miko Pellet, nor Elon Pape, or anyone who I've spoken to, is seeking to justify any current day violence because of the indignities of historical truths. This stems all the way back to my very first essay after October 7th and a reference to Slavoj Žižek, who was shouted down at a literature festival by, by a Zionist in the crowd, while he simply aimed not to justify, but to explain or contextualize violence, characterized as a form of, of resistance, which yes, can surge to a point of, let's call it self-condemning suicidal rage, in the spirit of Nat Turner or many thousands of so-called terror groups that you can name at any given time. I think there is nothing to understand here. One should go to the end in both directions, in the defense of the Palestinian rights as well as in fighting anti-Semitism. I am not I am not comparing. No, it's not relativism. I'm going much. Yeah, now you see what means in practice, listen to diversity, inclusion. Yes, but this is, this is the cancel logic. To have our way of diversity, some people, of course, must be first excluded. I'm talking about dozens of Palestinians that I know. Sorry if I explode now a little bit. Zizek called it a prohibition on analysis that he was fearing. And the term should really frighten everyone. The parallels between America's founding religious mythologies, like uh, Manifest Destiny, and the coinciding ethnic cleansing and genocides, and Israel's have been long discussed, so I won't do that here, but it should be no surprise that Trump suggests such a thing. Okay, so back to the single issue voting thing. And the second part of the problem, the more obvious problem, it's the lesser of two evils argument. This is where people try to, to trap you. You know, they say, okay, sure, maybe Biden or Kamala or, or whoever is bad, but, but Trump is worse, right? So you have to vote for the lesser of two evils or against the greater of two evils, you know, whatever way you put it, same action, you just have to do it. And I want to think about it like this, because basically these people are presenting what is known as a trolley problem in moral philosophy. And I've heard this argument a million times and I'm over it, but I will take it seriously here, because let's go back to the classic trolley problem, which was first developed by a moral philosopher named Philippa Foot, I think in the 70s. So it goes like this, you're standing on a platform uh, and there's a, a lever in front of you and there's a trolley hurtling down the tracks, out of control trolley, and there are people tied to the tracks just beyond a split, which is controlled by the lever next to you. So you, you can pull the lever and divert the trolley down one track where, where just a single person is tied to the tracks, which will kill them, or you cannot pull the lever and the trolley will keep going straight where it will kill five people who are tied to those tracks. And of course, the single person will be spared. Uh, and vice versa, of course, if, if you do pull the lever. So either way, people die, which is, which is bad, right? A kind of evil. And you have to make the choice. I mean, this is about to happen. The utilitarian or, or harm reduction ethicist just kind of does the math here. And it's like, well, five minus one is four or one minus five is four. That's all we get. So let's go ahead and pick the higher number and do that one. And of course, there are infinite ways to play with this scenario. You've probably seen these by imagining, you know, your, your loved one as the single person, or perhaps a group of people who you really despise as the group of five, and 
so on and so on. Or, you know, you could flip the initial conditions and have the one person in the line of the trolley that, that you find out of control and the five on the other track. There's just infinite twisted variations to play with here. Uh, and then there's also probably the most important one. There's also what's called the, the bridge variation, where instead of a, a lever on the platform, the trolley is out of control and headed towards five people, and but there's no split in the track. But there's a very fat man standing next to you, by the way. I think of, they've changed this to a very heavy backpack in some recent, uh, maybe more politically correct versions. But in the original one, it was a very fat man standing next to you that you could push onto the tracks, who, who you know, you've just done the math, I guess, will be heavy enough to stop the trolley and save the five people, but will kill the man in the process, which is the same math as the five minus one from earlier. But for most people, that one, the bridge variation, uh, somehow feels very different since you're actually pushing someone, presumably against their will. But again, against their wealth variable was also probably there with the one person who was tied to the tracks who might be yelling and pleading for his life as you pull the lever. Anyway, these trolley problems get pretty wild. Um, now, in an election year, people want you to think this is what voting is. The original trolley problem. You're on the platform, looking at that lever, trying to decide which track is worse. And yeah, some will argue that more people are tied up on Trump's track or more are on Kamala's track. It's a constant debate, and, and I get it. I've heard the Mehdi Hassans of the world make their case. And sure, there, there are arguments to be made, but take a step back. Look at the whole picture, because trolley problems can be really dumb sometimes because they overlook something obvious. And it's this bigger question. Who built this damn platform in the first place? Why are we even here forced to make this choice between two terrible outcomes? Who laid these tracks down? Who engineered this nightmare? And why are we all pretending that pulling a lever is the only option? And th this is where I get frustrated, because people act like the only thing we can do is choose between two evils, as if that's the only power we have. So what I'm saying is, I refuse to be a part of this horror show. I refuse to play this game. And let me be clear, this isn't some abstract moral exercise. This is real life. The platform we're standing on, it was built by people in power. And of course, also our own apathy and our continued participation and our distraction and our fears and everything else. This platform, this trolley problem, it's a trap of our own devise. And the idea that we're supposed to just accept it, that we're supposed to pick which group of people gets crushed under the wheels of the system, I want to reject that. It feels like something out of like a horror movie. It's like the Joker's experiment in the Dark Knight trilogy. Spoiler uh, alert here, though. If you haven't watched it, you should. It's a real masterpiece, I think. But I'm thinking of the climactic scene where the, the Joker has arranged this situation where, where two ships are in the harbor. And one is full of prisoners who presumably have done some bad stuff in their lives. And the other is full of regular citizens and, and pedestrians. And the Joker has rigged both boats with explosives. And he's put the detonator switch uh, for them on the opposite boat. So the, the citizens are holding the fate of the criminal boat, and the criminals are holding the fate of the citizen boat. At least that's what he tells them, of course. And of course, the arguments are, are being made uh, on both boats to blow up the opposite one. And the people are all, all holding the detonator and passing it from one person to the other. And the Joker's watching from afar, kind of next to the Batman, uh, as a witness. And the Joker for his character, kind of wants to prove that people will, will choose selfishly, that, that one or, or maybe even both of the boats will explode because they'll betray each other to, to save themselves, which, uh, if it happened, would, would justify his, his nihilism and, and chaotic stance towards society and, and man in general. But what happens in the film? Well, neither side pulls the trigger. No one can bring themselves to do it. It's kind of like that bridge variation moment in the trolley problem, right? Like you just can't by your own hand press the button. Maybe especially for the citizen boat because the person holding the detonator might even really be convinced by some argument that, that the prisoners have somehow forfeited their right to live you know, more than them because of their past behavior. But even that person just in that moment can't bring themselves to press the button. 
So the whole thing falls apart when neither boat explodes. It's a, a bit of, you know, humanity restored and, and the Joker's worldview is, is challenged and maybe dented in that moment. And then I won't ruin the rest of it. But this is the, the same thing. This is what I'm trying to hone in on here, that the systems of status quo and power entrenchment want us to accept that we're stuck in this system, that we have to choose between evils and that we are on one of those two boats. And now I know. <laughs> The Dark Knight is a comic book, it's a fantasy story, and Joker and Batman don't really exist. Uh, but you know what? Neither does the trolley. Moral philosophy class is, is one big fantasy story. So yeah, call me idealistic, call me naive, but no, I'm walking off this platform and I refuse to pull the lever. And don't get me wrong, I hear you. If you're worried about abortion rights, I hear you. I've been writing about those for years and I'm just as furious as you should be, that the Democrats have failed to protect women for decades with all kinds of measures that they could have pursued, such as a constitutional amendment or simply putting clinics on federal lands to get around state resistance, as Jill Stein has suggested. Uh, and those policies, the abortion bans, you know, they're not very popular. Abortion access, to some degree, is popular. Every time the damn issue comes up on state ballots, you see what happens. In fact, there's 10 states that have variations of the abortion question on the ballot this year, and I just urge you to watch the returns on those questions. Uh, many of them are talking about trying to enshrine protection in state constitutions at the 22 or 24 week mark. Uh, and there are other questions as well in red and blue states. Uh, I'm sure they'll be challenged all the way up to the federal level again, and we'll be stuck in a legal tug of war for years, no matter who wins the presidency. But keep an eye on those questions as a sort of opinion polling. If you happen to read my old essay, on it, on abortion. I'll, I'll put a link in the description as well. Uh, there are, were some of us sounding the alarm bells that there was a massive legal loophole in this Roe v. Wade case that was just insanely vulnerable and inadequate. You know, Roe v. Wade was a case about babies, not about women. Uh, anyway, it, it drives me up the wall to hear Democrat voters lecture me about the importance of abortion access while their beloved party did next to nothing to ensure that protection of the access. Uh, and of course, the cynic in me, and I'm sure in you, understands fully that they had, again, those perverse incentives, not a conspiracy, but perverse incentives to not solve the problem just so they could run on it every four years and get you all terrified it, ab about it all over again. I've seen Kamala say Trump didn't want her to solve abortion so she could run on it. Again, perverse incentives, true. We could flip this around all day. And if you're worried about Trump and his authoritarianism, um, maybe his willingness to use force, deadly force perhaps against domestic dissent and protesters, I hear you. I'm not blind to those stakes as well. I think that's absolutely part of what is on the trolley track. And I'm aware of Project 2025, but listen, my decision to refuse to stand on the platform does not mean I don't care about those things. It means I care too much to keep pretending that pulling a lever in this broken system is the way forward. And let me say this as a major reminder, a huge one, like bookmark this and remember to revisit it in your mind two years from now. No matter who wins this election, no matter who ends up in the White House, people are going to be barking, I told you so, at you. And me too. If Trump wins, and executes several nightmares like violence against anti-Trump or pro-Palestine protests in the streets, another version of, of the targeted Muslim ban, continued or even increased support for Israel, and a, a list of vengeful prosecutions to his personal enemies, none of which I doubt, you'll have people in your ears who wanted you to vote for Kamala to prevent that, telling you you know, how, how they told you so and it would have been better under Kamala and it's your fault. And if Kamala wins and we have continued neoconservative, Dick Cheney approved foreign policy and corporate takeover and continued arms sales to Israel and continued garbage healthcare policies, more lip service with no serious action on climate change or gun control or abortion access, and endless foreign wars being prioritized over the neglected Americans outside of the coastal cities, and everything else that people dislike about the modern American Democratic neoconservative party, the people who wanted you to her to lose uh, will tell you that it would have been better under Trump and it's your fault. So that's just how a trolley problem works because everyone is so sure that their math of who was on the tracks is the right one. 
you just have to put a ton of fog on the other track that, that you spared in this picture so that you can't really see it clearly, but you have people who, who claim that they can see it through through the fog and, and they're shouting at you about how bad it is if you pull the lever uh, and, and you just run that experiment again. And that's really the situation that we're in. So don't let someone like Mehdi Hassan lecture you about how he warned you about it when he shows you the awful headlines when Trump is in office. And don't lecture him about how we warned him when Kamala wins and continues bombing children in tents when she's in office. Just stop this madness and stop playing this game. And in either case, in either one, the fight really has to continue. I'm sure we'll, we're all running the scenarios out in our heads about which path might lead to a positive change. I've done both of them, I'm not sure. And in either case, the pressure on the street, which yes, has the Palestinian cause as its signs, but is some about something so much bigger and expansive, expansive as I've been stressing on the show, that just can't let up. It needs to be on Kamala Harris's doorstep the day after she takes up the oath, if it's her, or of course on Trump's lawn, if it's him. I'm talking here about what I spoke about to Vijay uh, again, the new mood of the global South. You know, something really is shifting beneath our feet at this moment. And honestly, it has very little to do with this election. Uh, I just saw that the, the video of the uh, indigenous congresswoman in Australia yelling at the visiting King Charles, you know, you're not my king. This kind of thing is brewing everywhere. BJ and his institute call it the new mood of the global south. And, and I think that's the moment that we're in. And okay, one last flourish here as I finish up. I need to insist something here. Because people are telling me to vote. I am voting. I am voting with an empty ballot, which is different than staying home. And it's really important because on election night or week or month or whatever it ends up being, you're going to see numbers flash on the screen. You know, the news will tell you this person has 47% and this one has 46%. And seeing those numbers, you'll get the impression that like half of the country showed up to pull the lever for one candidate or the other. But here's the truth. When you look at the actual percentage of eligible voters who turn out, when you factor in how many people just don't vote at all or stay home, the numbers are much, much lower. In fact, I looked at these numbers and these are the numbers of eligible voters who literally went to the polls and pulled the lever for the person who ended up sitting in the president's chair and took office in the last 10 elections. You could see the last one was inflated, obviously, with COVID. There was a higher number in mail-in voting, but these numbers are not very high. You've got 23.7% for Bill Clinton, 25, 30% for Obama, and that's it. So when you're watching the returns come in, just think of these numbers. And on inauguration day, just think of 10 random Americans who were eligible to vote, and literally about seven to seven and a half of them didn't pull the lever for the person on the stage. It paints a very different picture, doesn't it? And yes, that might be apathy, <laughs> but for many, it must be something like I'm talking about, like a refusal to participate in a perverse system. At least that's what I would hope. It's like saying, you know, we don't accept this. So yeah, I'm voting blank and people give me shit for it, saying, you know, they won't even care, it won't matter. And you're probably right, but you know what? If you're voting for the lesser of two evils, they don't care about that either. They're not listening. On inauguration day, they can't tell the difference between a vote for them or against the other guy. It all looks the same on the sheet of paper with a check mark. And they're just celebrating their victory, convincing themselves with their smile that they're the chosen one up on that stage. I mean, it would be an incredible scene to have protests at the inauguration for, let's say, Kamala if she wins, with people holding signs that say reluctant Kamala voter, or I voted against the other guy, not you, or you didn't win, he lost. You know, I mean, Kamala has been saying she's going to earn your vote for this last however so many months, but how is she doing that? By telling you how bad the other guy is constantly. That's not earning anything. It's insulting and you honestly deserve better. And listen, if you do, do pull the lever for her because you think it's the only way to stop Trump and, and you just can't take it, fine. I get it, I really do. But make sure you let her know, loud and clear, that you're furious about the system, 
that put you in that position, that you were dragged to the voting booth kicking and screaming to pull that lever. This platform is unacceptable, and it's going to take more than an election to fix it. And then, of course, there's Dr. Jill Stein. And fine, I also get it. And let's be honest, her lever on the platform is not even wired to the tracks. It's not her fault, but the, the system and the trolley track makers make sure to snip all of the wires and, you know, let the rats gnaw at the wires or the rain erode the wires, whatever you like in the analogy, to make sure that those wires are just not even changing the trolley. Um, but yes, the number when you pull that lever does show up on a screen somewhere. Uh, and do not, this is for you Jill Stein voters, do not let anyone tell you that a vote for this thing is a vote for that thing. Do not let anyone tell you that a lever that says Stein actually says Trump or Harris or whatever. This is not George Orwell here. You know, war is peace, escalate to de-escalate, Stein spells Trump. No, don't Orwell me, bro. I'm trying to get that one to catch on. Don't Orwell me. I know what the lever says and I'm not an idiot. You're not an idiot. I understand the consequences, and how dare you presume that pulling that lever has anything to do with pulling another? Get angry when people suggest this. Laugh at them and tell them to learn how to spell and read. You know what the lever says. But I'm not voting for Jill Stein either, because I want to, of course, yes, register my vote against genocide, which I think I'm clearly doing by refusing those levers. But I also want to register a protest against the conditions of this trolley problem entirely. And so here is my small plea and the inspiration for my blank ballot. And it comes from a short story called Seeing, which was written by the Chilean science fiction writer Jose Saramoga in 2004. Um, and the aforementioned philosopher Slava Zizek references it and recounts the plot in the concluding paragraphs of this short book that he wrote called Violence uh, to make his point. Um, and it reveals kind of a wistful hope that I have for collective coordinated blank ballot action. So I'll just read from it here. Again, this is Zizek referencing, referencing the brilliant Saramago Mago story here. So I recommend both and have both of their faces on the screen, but I'm gonna read from this now. Seeing tells the story of the strange events in an unnamed capital city of an unidentified democratic country. When the election day morning is marred by torrential rain, voter turnout is disturbingly low, but the weather breaks by mid-afternoon and the population heads en masse to their voting stations. The government's relief is short-lived, however, when vote counting reveals that over 70% of the ballots cast in the capital have been left blank. Baffled by this apparent civic collapse, the government gives the citizenry a chance to make amends just one week later with another election day. The results are, wor are worse. Now 83% of the ballots are blank. The two major political parties, the ruling party of the right, that's P-O-T-R, and their chief adversary, the party of the middle, P-O-T-M, are in panic, while the haplessly marginalized party of the left, P-O-T-L, produces an analysis claiming that the blank ballots are essentially a vote for their progressive agenda. Is this an organized conspiracy to overthrow not just the ruling government, but the entire democratic system? If so, who is behind it? And how did they manage to organize hundreds of thousands of people into such subversion without being noticed? When asked how they voted, ordinary citizens simply respond that such information is private, and besides, is not leaving the blank ballot their right? Unsure how to respond to a benign protest, but certain that an anti-democratic conspiracy exists, the government quickly labels the movement terrorism, pure and unadulterated and declares a state of emergency, allowing the government to suspend all constitutional guarantees. 500 citizens are seized at random and disappear into secret interrogation sites, and their status is coded red for secrecy. Their families are informed in Orwellian style not to worry about the lack of information concerning their loved ones, since in that very silence lay the key that could guarantee their personal safety. When these moves bear no fruit, the right-wing government adopts a series of increasingly drastic steps, from declaring a state of siege and concocting plots to create disorder to, withdraw, to withdrawing the police and seat of government from the capital, sealing all the city's entrances and exits, and finally manufacturing its own terrorist ringleader. The city continues to function near normally throughout, the people parrying each of the government's thrusts 
in inexplicable unison with a truly Gandhian level of nonviolent resistance. In his review of the novel, Michael Wood noted a parallel. In a famous poem written in East Germany in 1953, Brecht quotes a contemporary as saying that the people have lost the trust of the government. Would it not therefore be easier, Brecht slyly asks, to dissolve the people and have the government elect another one? Sarah Go Saramago's novel is a parable of what happens when neither government nor people can be dissolved. <clears throat> and Zizek here, while the parallel holds, the concluding characterization seems to fall short. The unsettling message of seeing is not so much the indissolubility of both people and the government as the compulsive nature of democratic rituals of freedom. What happens is that by abstaining from vote, people effectively dissolve the government, not only in the limited sense of overthrowing the existing government, but more radically. Why is the government thrown into such a panic by the voters' abstention? It is compelled to confront the fact that it exists, that it exerts power only insofar as it is accepted as such by its subjects, accepted even in the mode of rejection. The, vote, the voters' abstention goes further than the intrapolitical negation, the vote of no confidence. It rejects the very frame of decision. In psychoanalytic terms, the voters' abstention is something like the psychotic Verwufung, or foreclosure, or rejection, which is more radical move than the repression. According to Freud, the repressed is intellectually accepted by the subject, since it is named, and at the same time it is negated because the subject refuses to recognize him or herself in it. In contrast to this foreclosure, rejects the term from the symbiotic tout court. To circumscribe the contours of this radical rejection, one is tempted to evoke Badu's provocative thesis. It is better to do nothing than to contribute to the invention of formal ways of rendering visible that which empire already recognizes as existent. Better to do nothing than to engage in localized acts, the ultimate function of which is to make the system run more smoothly. The threat today is not passivity, but pseudo-activity the urge to be active, to participate, to mask the nothingness of what goes on. People intervene all the time, do something. Academics participate in meaningless debates and so on. The truly difficult thing is to step back, to withdraw. Those in power often prefer even a critical participation, a dialogue to silence. Just to engage us in dialogue, to make sure our ominous passivity is broken. The voters' abstention is thus a true political act. It forcefully confronts us with the vacuumness of today's democracies. And there is one more final small sentence to Zizek's book that I'm going to come back and finish with, but let me just first interject this note. Elections rarely spark real change. I mean, in, in, in that story and the blank ballot revolution, there certainly is a change happening on election day, but it's also science fiction. And I suppose it could happen in a U.S. election, let's say if Kamala wins and produces a, a, a dreadfully predictable neoconservative four years and asks you to vote again for her in 2028, and the opposing candidate might be some kind of Trump 2.0 figure like Elon Musk or, or even a neoconservative clone like Nikki Haley or Tim Scott. Maybe then the blank ballot revolution gets underway. I don't know. But if you look at history, the moments that seem to matter, the ones that change the world, they don't usually happen on election day. They happen when people stand up, when they refuse to accept the status quo, and are usually sparked by some more seemingly organic or, or random moment than a scheduled election. Think about the, the self-immolation of, of the Tunisian street vendor that sparked the Arab Spring, or Rosa Parks taking a seat on a bus, or George Floyd's murder, or any number of other moments in history, because elections come and go. And social issues like gay marriage, which Barack Obama was against and, and ran being against and then turned out to be the man with the pen who got to sign it into law and pretend he was always for it, or interracial marriage or the legalization of marijuana or alcohol prohibition in the past or abortion access and on and on and on. They, they all have similar stories, including the stories of, of how wars end and start. It's not elections. I mean, 
Democrat Lyndon Johnson authorized the Vietnam War after JFK began increasing military advisors and special forces in the area, and Richard Nixon, of all people, was the president who signed the peace treaty nine years later. Do I think election days would have changed much of that story? No, not really. Do I think the social forces at play and mass mobilizations, social changes and societal changes were important to the way that that story unfolded in Vietnam? Yeah, absolutely. And all of those things tend to happen on their, their own tidal way outside of the election cycle. People think social change happens on, on sort of a straight line graph over time, but it's almost always in an S curve where there's sort of a, a slow early grow, growth and then it hits some kind of threshold where it can jump from like 10% to 80% in a very short amount of time. I mean, think of legalization of marijuana or gay marriage in America. The S curve is by far the most common pattern in evolution and, and social science. Like the one Mr. Vladimir Lenin once said, there are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks where decades happen. And he's talking about an S curve there. And so now, I'll go back and read that one final line from Zizek, Zizek's book because it responds to probably the recoil and rightful fear that you may have just experienced uh, when I quoted, quoted Vladimir Lenin. So he finishes with this just one piece. If one means by violence a radical upheaval of the basic social relations, then crazy and tasteless as it may sound, the problem with historical monsters who slaughtered millions was that they were not violent enough. Sometimes doing nothing is the most violent thing to do. So yeah, election day will come and go, but we'll still be here and the fight isn't over. And that is why my ballot is blank.